Okay, let me end this. Um, okay, stop share. Okay. For the next session, our next speaker, I would like to introduce you, um, Dr. Ying Weiming. He's a consultant at the Department of Emergency Medicine in Dr. Uh, Ying Teng Fong General Hospital and a consultant of Unit of Pre-Hospital Emergency Care, Ministry of Health. Dr. Ying's interests range from pre-hospital emergency medicine to quality and safety in healthcare to medical education and clinical research. He teaches medical professions and professionals such as medical students to specialist trainees, nurses, pharmacists, and paramedics. He received the National Healthcare Group Teaching Award for his contributions in medical education. Dr. Ying is experienced in managing medical and traumatic resuscitation cases. Notably, he has performed rare resuscitative procedures such as um, perimortem caesarean and section that resulted in infant survival. He also contributed to the development of my responder application, which, which responds to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and fire and fire cases in his community. His talk today is about technology improves quality of pre-hospital resuscitation Singapore experiences. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Ying Wai Ming. Oh, I'm gonna have to unmute you first. Uh, um. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the nice introduction. And uh, it's my privilege to be here. And before even I share my experience, I've already learned a ton from the three speakers ahead of me. Um, I'm the last one speaking here, so I will try to make it short and sweet. Okay, so um, this talk is about how do we use the technology to improve the quality of the pre-hospital resuscitation in Singapore. And a little bit of uh, background. So Singapore is a, is, a, is a small island and the area is about 722 um, square kilometers with about 5.64 million population. Uh, multi ethnic group and the emergency medical service hotline is 995 provided by the Singapore Civil Defense Force. We have about 70 ambulances and the fleet is increasing over the years. Our population uh, are as such and uh, during the COVID, we have seen a drop of the population, but have since picked up a little bit. And uh, the image on the right, if you look at this, we are not too old, but we are actually experiencing a bit of a silver tsunami as well. So overall, the Singapore healthcare system is provided by three main clusters, namely National University Health System, which are, I'm working in, and National Healthcare Group, and lastly, Sing Health, where my boss, Prof. Marcus, works in. So how do we use the smart technologies to help in particular cardiac arrest? That's my area of interest. If we follow the patient journey, right? And if someone arrested, you need someone to pick up the patient to recognize there's a cardiac arrest, someone to do CPR and defibrillate early, someone to actually get the you know resource, i.e. the EMS team early. The EMS team have to actually send the patient to the hospital timely and have the post resource care. And I think Dr. Sata has already shown a chart that, you know, the pre-hospital, in fact, the, the first ring of survival is actually the most important one, right? So uh, along the line, then we'll talk about how do we do the crowdsourcing of the first responders and AED, how we use the real-time CPR guidance to the first responder, as well as the early communication with the emergency department. Number one is the My Responder app. I think it is... Uh, it is known that many countries has you know developed this uh, crowd resource crowdsourcing app, and uh, as a background in Singapore, we are seeing increasing number of uh, EMS calls, and majority of them are really emergency. Given the projection in year 2030, we will have many more calls. That is hard for us to keep our key performance index, despite growing in fleets and the crew numbers. So we really need to offload some of the. I would say tasks or responsibilities to the community, i.e. bystanders or first responders who help early because in the future you might not see ambulance coming 
as early every time, right? So the MyResponder app is utilizing the fact that most of the smartphone now has a GPS geolocation technology, and we can we actually have a program to see the location of AEDs, namely the ready program, and we can actually activate the community responders that we have trained to perform an early CPR. So we use this to notify the members of public, hopefully to increase the survival rate of the cardiac arrest victims. This is a piece of the whole system. As well, Dr. Sata has mentioned earlier, it takes a system to save a life. So given the journey, someone collapsed at zero minutes, the caller calls 995, and then the emergency hotline will actually activate the fire bike, which is the motorbike taxi example in Thailand, the ambulance, and the biresponder who are active within 400 meters radius of the incident scene. Whoever within 400 meters active in my responder app will be activated. And once you're accepted, you will go to the scene much earlier than the EMS crew and start performing CPR as well as recruit your AED for defibrillation. Subsequently, the fire bike will arrive in approximately eight minutes, followed by the ambulance by about 11 minutes. So in the past, when we have a cardiac arrest, we can only wait for the ambulance and it comes 11 minutes. And you know, and I know 11 minutes is too long for survival. And then we put in the fire bike system that make it a little faster. And now we use the bystander to come as soon as possible. So we greatly reduce the time from arrest to CPR initiation. We believe anyone can help. That is a philosophy back in Singapore. So when we train CPR, we don't train people for a day or four hours, we train for one hour because we want the people to be CPR aware because now we have telephone dispatch assisted CPR. It's no longer in the old era of a solo performance. Now it's a little bit more like the adventure type where people come as a team and everyone perform and you have help back in the dispatch center, like your headquarters, right? So um, in, in this case, you can actually help with carrying the AED, you can usher the ambulance crew because they might not find the exact location every time. You can give more center, uh, give more details to the op center on top of performing CPR and AEDs. This is a screenshot for the MyResponder app, just taken minutes ago. So right now we have about 135,000 registered responders in the system. We have since responded to a total of 88,000 cases. And you can see the breakdown of the cases for month, as well as differentiating between the cardiac arrest and fire, because we use this app to activate responders to help with minor fire as well. And the map below, you can see the location of the past five fire cases and the last five cardiac arrest cases. So say you are having a phone and you got activated, they'll give you the rough location, the location of the places, but not much of a detail as of the unit number, et cetera only when you keep a step. So as I mentioned before, we do have a system of plotting AED on the island, and we aim to have one public access AED in every two public housing blocks. And we have already reached that target three or four years ago, and we still continue to add on new AEDs into various locations. For that, we need to have a smart system, i.e. A, a map, to actually inform us where is the AED. So here, once you click accept, you will have the location of AED real time shown to you. So we actually put the ready system on top of the Marine Sponder app. So you will be able to go and retrieve the AEDs for help. And once you click accept, you'll be given the unit number, which is a bit more detailed. Once you arrive, you render help. After the incidents, you'll be um, asked to have a short response on the case, whether they are CPR performed, AED use and you arrive before SCDF. So this is a rough guide. And uh, we have actually, since the app installation increasing, affected a little bit during the COVID, but we are now recovering. All right, and we have stable recruitment of the registered user because we have a regular, um, I would say workshop or various events that utilize and leverage to you know, publicize our app and to recruit more data. The cases that we have seen in the blue color bar is the number of cases per year. Uh, I need to clarify that this is the 
suspected cardiac arrest because based on the AHA guidelines, when the victim is not responsive and has not normal breathing, it is cardiac arrest unproven otherwise. And we know there will be um, misdiagnosis at times. So uh, in parallel, we have a system to help identifying the true cardiac arrest. The dispatch center will actually ask the provider to put the palm on the victim's abdomen. If the victim's abdomen is not moving, i.e. there's no breathing, because we realize the lay person cannot tell normal breathing very well. So sometimes if they are drunk, they are asleep, they'll be taken as no good cardiac arrest, right? On the other hand, to the extreme, if someone having a real cardiac arrest, but having a gasping breath, right? They will be taken as having a normal breathing and miss the golden opportunities. So the COVID situation has actually reduced the number of the suspected cardiac arrest reported. And on top of that, since we are getting more accurate in identifying the cardiac arrest truly, we are seeing a pickup in number, but it's better than the last time. For each case, we can achieve uh, 11 to 14 notifications per case because we are growing our numbers of survivor pools. Now, next thing is a big gap that we need to address. Even though per case, we can activate or notify up to 14 notifications, there are about one responders who accept the notification, right? And despite that, we don't have all the responders arriving to the scene as well. So this is the area that we are actually focusing on with various kinds of study, the qualitative like focus group discussion to look into the issue of why people are not taking up the notification. So that's about that. The second experience that we are going to show is the CPR card, okay? So this is a credit card size device. Um, they are landmarking over here and there's an on and off button. It is supposed to be a single use device and there will be a, you know, a, a marker to inform you about the depth and the rate of the compression real time. So in the past when people performing CPR, no one really knows how good they are doing. Everyone thought they are doing quite okay. But here you can see real time that you are doing too fast, you're not pressing hard enough or deep enough, etc. And retrospectively, you can collect the data. So this is an echo to the network CPR that Prof Shin has mentioned. I think Singapore is trying to you know, visualize in a similar way and we're trying to do that as well. So responders with my responder app will have this link to the DCPR app and combining with the CPR card that is Bluetooth enabled that not only show the quality of uh, cardiac uh, CPR to the responders real time, they also feedback real time back to the dispatcher. So the dispatcher over here can actually see the quality of CPR, make sure it's in the good range. So we are not contented with after the case feedback, we want it to be improved there and there. So we use this system to connect responders, dispatchers, and also in future ED real time as a network rather than individual departments. Okay, so the same thing, once you're accepted and when your prep arrive, you will be, the app would automatically link to the TCPR link app and then you can start performing the CPR with the direct video vision. And then, uh, you know, the system will tell you how good they are doing as well as the dispatch center on the other side will guide you along the way. This is what a dispatcher will see. So you have a video showing correct placement, correct posture, good depth, good rate, full recall, and the metronome will be there to assist as well. And then the location, uh, the quality of the CPR will be given real time with a, you know, feedback given by the dispatcher. Okay, so again, very fast is the second thing we are talking about. The third thing is how do we then connect the EMS crew with the emergency department, right? This is what we call OMI, Operational Medical Networks Informatics Integrator. Essentially, it is a platform linking the EMS crew and the hospital departments in the pre-hospital service. So the paramedics will be able to view to share of the patient data to improve the care management throughout the continuum of care, even before arriving to the hospital. This is built on the backbone of the government initiative that we want one patient, one record. 
So like what Prof Shin has earlier mentioned in Singapore, we use the national IC number and every patient has only one IC number and we put all the data into it, including the healthcare data. So by right, if a patient goes to different institution, i.e. the clinic or the hospital or in the ED, and now pre-hospital care, you'll be all recorded into the same NRIC number. So you go to this system, you can find all the details you want in one platform. It is supposed to be patient-focused, contain very clean, high-quality data, and helps with operational improvement and real-time coordinated care. Not to mention in the future, quality improvement with measurement and improvement. The key features for the OMI is number one, the access to the national electronic health records, which I will share a little bit later. And while patient is being cared for, the vital signs from the defibrillator will be feedback real time into the system and the provider from the destination ED will be able to see that. And we also have features of pre-registration and in the future, we want to have a features of a telemedicine as well. So essentially, it is a Samsung tab. It's the same tab used by the ED as well as the paramedics. It's just the layout. So in short, while the provider's EMS crew care for the patient using the Omni tablet, the data will be shared with the displaced stamina in the emergency department. So ED would know about the patient prior to the conveyance. And this is what the dispatch, uh, sorry, the display terminal in the ED will see. I can see the number of patients, the number of different breakdown. They will be able to see the patient equity status or PEC status, whether it's urgent, semi-urgent, non-urgent. I know the symptom and I will know the patient's NRIC number over here if I want to. The rest of the demographic, for example, the age, the gender, and which ambulance is sending here, the A of the ambulance arrival and the countdown timer will be there. Once I want to see the patient's data, I just click inside and we can see the data for the patient. In this case, the medication given timestamp and the treatment given timestamp all along the patient journey, journey shown, right? So once the case is completed, i.e. the EMS crew already delivered the patient to the hospital and they have completed their documentation. So all this, documentation will be sent, including the top ECG, into the National Electronic Health Records. In the past, it was all paper. Now it is all in electronic format and sent immediately after the case is closed and primarily conclude the case. So it actually uh, helps a lot in terms of providing the real-time data for the patient. Okay. Now, the pre-registration comes when in Usually, the patient has to physically arrive to the ED before the registration can start. And uh, it has proven to give a little bit of a delay while we want to care for the patient who needs resuscitation. So in this case, what we do is we will pre-register the patient prior to patient arrival. So when patient arrives, he or she is already into the system. So a lot of times when patient is uh, called as a standby case or certain uh, for example, chest pain, and I already can see the patient's data into the hospital EMR system, and I already can know about the patient even before the arrival. And the display terminal will give me the vital signs. So I know this patient was hypotensive, the patient is tachycardic, and you know, uh, actually desaturated. And along the way, if the vital sign changes to better or worse, I will be able to know before patient arrival. So the whole team in ED will be prepared to take this patient, whether they are sick or not. All right, and this is uh, some of the new case that we are going to show. Um, road traffic accident, and people always say a picture tells a thousand words. Before the patient arrival, I already have the image, and I know the patient's location as a front seat passenger. I know roughly the potential impact to the patient, and I know what particular injury to look out for. And when the patient arrives, I can already care for the patient, and it greatly reduces the time. Second use case, coming from chest pain, I have the ECG prior to death. And one look, I know this is a STEMI. So I activated the patient and their hospital who actually activate the cath lab using this pre-hospital ECG, even prior to patient arrival. So patient would be like, pass through ED in the breeze and get you know, PCI or coronary angiogram in a very fast manner. 
So the problem that we listed along patient journey, this is what we are uh, our answer or our experience to you know how to address all these challenges. And like I said, GRA 10 steps to improve cardiac survival. Step seven, in particular, with smart technologies, we are doing our best to you know improve. And that's, there's definitely a, a huge gap. And there are many things that we still can improve in order to improve patient survival, right? Some other interesting project that we are doing, you know, a bit of a smart technology to help with this. Uh, we embark on this virtual Singapore project initiated by the government. So we actually have a 3D model of the Singapore island and we use that, uh, including all the routes and, you know, the, the blocks to do various uses. Number one, uh, we actually have a training game for EMS crew to do in the disaster because we know disaster don't happen very frequently. We need them to keep alert and know how to triage the patient on the field. So we actually created this game and we have a, a data that actually put into the intervention data, the injury data of the patient, the accident data and create a virtual patient. We can actually decide on the number of victims we want, percentage, how many very severe case, how many workers, etc., and they will come into the game. So depends on your role as a trash officer or first aid post officer or evacuation officer, you will be tasked to a different task and you'll be assessed on your performance. All right. And all these things are actually put into the Unity game engine. And in future, we hope that we can use um, AR, OBR, HoloLens, etc., to train our EMS crew in order to actually improve their disaster performance. Number two, this is the example for one of the EDs that we have the 3D mapping and we use that to actually simulate real time on the patient flow model in a day-to-day -day basis, as well as in cases of fire or disaster or even pandemic, etc. Right, lastly, we have the data on the AED location. We have the historical data of the cardiac arrest. So we actually come up with a program of a public access defibrillation decision support system, i.e., you give me your location, you give me your historical data, the number of the AED that you can put in. I can tell you where and how much AED to put in order to maximize your outcome. All right. We can optimize a few ways. You can actually maximize the coverage, i.e., one AED can cover as many cardiac arrest cases as possible, or minimize the average distance to the closest AED, i.e. how many AEDs I need so that all the provider can walk a minimum distance to retrieve the AED. And the last thing, which is our main focus here, is to maximize the expected survival rate. How many AED and where should I put it in order to maximize the survival rate? So um, this is a big picture, the needs analysis that we perform in the Singapore pre-hospital emergency care system. A long patient journey from pre-hospital to managed course to dispatch, managed EMS, transition and return, and post-care, there are various challenges, all right? And it's a busy slide, then I wouldn't spend time to talk into details in the interest of time. And this is our answer to that. So I'm merely sharing the first part, mobile application, patient, uh, public mobile application for emergency, and a little bit in the middle to uh, about Omni, about the CPR card. But there are many other things along the way uh, in this giant map that you know I have no time or uh, enough expertise to comment on. Prof. Marcus would be the one to actually you know explain all this thing. But I, I hope the audience will understand that this is a very complex system and there are still many challenges along the way. So we can actually, you know, put our heads together to identify the low-lying fruits and work together to deliver the best care for the patient. That concludes my presentation and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ying. So any questions from the floor? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, great presentation. Um, quick question. So. Uh, when you talk about the MyStander app, how many cardiac arrests uh, have to happen for one person to be in that 400 meter radius to accept it and to actually get there before 
um, the providers or what percentage, you know, maybe ask a different way, what percentage of cases um, mm -hmm. my, my, my responder app actually allowing a bystander to get there uh, before uh, EMS arrival or first responder arrival, do you know? Um, for the time being, we don't have such a granularity of the data, but what we do know in the bigger picture is that despite we notify a lot of cases, we have only one responder accepted per case, and when we perform the focus group discussion, the rough kite is probably about 50-50. And uh, most of the time, the I mean about 50% of the time, the responder will come prior to the EMS. And sometimes the system will actually tell the bystander that the ambulance has arrived to the case. Thank you so much. And case close. So they actually turn back halfway. Um, that probably is the reason why the Despite the notification, we don't have many people who actually arrive to the case. But if you're talking about percentage, you can roughly take 0.6 divided by up to 14. So it's actually very, very low percentage that we need to work on. Thank you. I have a question about the, the CPR card. That's about yes. the credit, um, credit card size. Very interesting. So, so how how do you distribute these cards to 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 the citizens? I, I mean, do you select um, that uh, which kind of citizens that would help have this cash, or they have to buy it by themselves? Mm, for the time being, this is still in development phase. We have not yet uh, decide on the optimum model of distribution. But what we have done for the phase one is we identify what we call super responders because in my responder app, we know who uh, actually responded, including myself. So the we identify the top numbers or the top crew that actually perform most and arrive to the scene and render help and we actually distribute the cards to them. So this is our way to actually maximize the use rather than, you know, um, cast an ass white and give everyone uh, a more cost-effective way is to identify the super responder and give it to them because either their location is prone to a cardiac arrest due to the demographic around them or pay, uh, patient case mix, patient profile, or they are, you know, very enthusiastic to always render help. So this will maximize our success rate. Okay, thank you. And, and about the My Responder app, um, do you provide feedback or the, the outcomes of the patients to, to those who respond to who respond to um, the my, my responder app? It would be a very uh, like great inspiration if if you do the CPR in some um, and and that person survives. Do, do you normally uh, provide feedback? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I I always got asked about this question, especially during the focus group discussion, because when the users that have responded to the case came to us, they always have this kind of query: How do I know the outcome? Uh, there are a few ways to dissect this question. Number one is the patient privacy. Technically, a uh, patient journey along the way until the end, um, we are not supposed to uh, share the outcome to someone else because of the concern of privacy. Number two, the percentage of a successful resuscitation is actually much less than you know patient being passed away. So the worry is we don't have a robust enough system to provide psychological care to the providers if I tell them I'm sorry your patient died and a lot of them actually will get very sad and discouraged to do so on top of the privacy concern. We do however celebrate the success case so annually we will have a survivor event and we have a responder event so we actually put the survivor and the group of super responders together and we share about you know their story and we celebrate that you know we have saved a few lives this year and uh they will actually be encouraged more in this way that they know they are survivor from this system rather than each individual case giving feedback to them that you know um, the patient didn't survive the next case again the patient didn't survive and repeatedly people get more and more discouraged so i hope they answer your question yes thank you any other question uh Hello, Dr. Ming. Uh, I'm Dr. Sata. Nice to meet you. Okay. Hi, Dr. Sata. So I, uh, I have a question. So from the, on the other hand, from uh, I because we I think we know that we have the data that talking about the bystander 
or the first responder have the post traumatic uh correct uh, post traumatic uh stress uh, stress uh, post traumatic stress when they respond on on the field how do uh, my responder have uh, tracking on that so or, or do they have any data on that in singapore uh again my answer to that would be no uh we have a psychological hotline to help the ems crew but that is uh you know confined to the ems system i.e the sdf only so for the general public we have uh tried to you know establish a system for a few years trying to you know provide the support to them uh what we do right now is we do have a facebook group to put all the responders together and we welcome them to share their thing and they can you know our private message any of us if they need any support but yet uh the answer to this would be that there are common hotlines given by the you know, psychiatry department to the vast public, to anyone who needed help, not just the responders itself. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ming. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have some time for a very quick question for Dr. Shin. I think this um, this question is going to be interesting. So, um, Dr. Yuli Prasio asked that in the areas where the EMS system is still not fully recognized and we're just st starting to build the EMS system. So, how do you? So, what's your recommendation to um, provide uh, to maintain and develop the system? Like, how do you? prepare resources, building teams and, and government supports or other things? Okay, you ask everything for development of EMS. Yes. Yeah, but uh, uh, one of the answer is that every EMS is, has to take their own barriers and challenges. Every, every, every system. So uh, I know the different model, different resource, different setting uh, can give us many uh, challenges but uh, if you know the way where to go where we are going if we know the way we can easily go together but if we don't know the way it is not easy to make something i just believe that's just only principle so ems is a social system to make a safety the people want more safe and then healthy condition in their community. The people want more to resource, uh, use the resource. Sometimes there are many arguments, there are some challenges, but the most important direction is to make safety. So I think uh, the, your question is about how can you build up the EMS system? Okay, from the community, from the hospital, from the EMS, we can start, but where's the direction? And the direction is coming where? From the benchmarking, from the best practice model, then we can discuss, and then we can small success story. It can make sure you can make a more expanded idea to the other part. So two, two, impor two important questions, but to simple reply, sorry. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shin. So uh, before everyone, uh, before you leave, we would like to have a photo for our first resuscitation symposium, um, both from online and on-site. So um, people who are online watching us, um, uh, if, if you do not mind, please um, turn on the ca camera so we can take a photo. We have you as a, um, a background here on the screen, and then everyone, please come to the front and we'll have a group photo. Wow, someone is actually running. <laughs> okay. Okay, everyone in the room, please come to the front. We have group photos.
we have to take three at least three pictures because we have three pages of of people in Zoom. Okay. Okay. Douglas. <laughs> Okay. Okay, first page in Zoom. One more time, one more time. No, two more times. Okay. The second page. Oh, wait, wait, wait for me. Okay, thank you everyone. So I, I would like to in, invite you all to, I would like to show the uh, innovation lab, the CILA innovation lab to you. So, so we, uh, I, I would like to uh, invite you all to, I, I gonna open the innovation lab to, to, to you all, uh, just, just uh, nearby here, the wait outside, wait outside. Okay, so, we are done for today. Thank you everyone for participating in our first resuscitation symposium in Sirat EMS um, Center. And I hope we'll see each other again in the next meeting. Um, thank you everyone. Thank you all the speakers today. I think it's very inspirational and we get a lot of things from learning a lot of things from today's conference. Thank you everyone. <laughs>